This video is sponsored by Conflict of Nations, a free online player versus player strategy game where you can lead your nation in a modern day global conflict. Set in the present day, research and make use of over 100 cutting edge weapons and vehicles to fight with up to 64 real players at a time in exciting real time combat. Declare war on your neighbours or forge alliances as strong as the coalition of Desert Storm. Conquer provinces, take capitals, and fight for world domination in hard fought campaigns that can last weeks. Conflict of Nations is cross platform, so you can compete with your friends on both PC and mobile on the same account to find out who is the ultimate general. The Operations Room fans who sign up by clicking the unique link below will receive 13,000 gold and a month of premium subscription completely free. Don't miss out, as the offer is only available for 30 days, so click the link in the description below, choose your country, and start fighting your way to victory. Widow75 Ugly, we're running low on ammo. We're still here for you, but we've got to decide what's best to use. We're going to go in Danger Close first with High Sap Rockets, then Fleshette Rockets. You happy with that? Roger, Danger Close, happy with that. It's like the bloody Hyderabad Zoo down here. They're making animal noises again. Surrounded by close to 100 Taliban insurgents, the four beleaguered British soldiers dive to the bottom of the ditch as the lead Apache pitches over, turbines screaming as machine gun fire whips past the attack helicopter. Ugly 5-0 adjusts its aim as it hurtles towards the earth, then vanishes in smoke as the rockets race from their tubes. It's the third day of Operation Chakush. It was meant to last just three hours. After a series of successful battles through the summer of 2007, British forces in Helmand Province, Afghanistan, are seeking to build on their victories. The joint UK-Afghan battle group South is planning a new attack to keep up the pressure on the Taliban. Codenamed Operation Chakush, the Dari word for hammer, this next offensive is planned to be a dramatic but relatively straightforward three-hour operation. The plan is for elements of Battle Group South to secure a crossing over the Nar A Saraj Canal and advance into the lush green zone along the east bank of the Helmand River. It is hoped that this will drive the estimated 150 strong, demoralised and beaten Taliban away from the Afghan villages of Mirmandab and Hyderabad, obviously not to be confused with the large Indian city. Once this is completed, a new forward operating base will be constructed by the Royal Engineers to help the coalition maintain control over the area. On the morning of the 24th of July 2007, the bulk of the battle group moves out from their desert staging area. B Company of the 1st Battalion Royal Welsh lead, their new Mastiff MRAPs snaking north, followed by the more vulnerable open-top Land Rover WMIKs and the Afghan National Army in their unprotected trucks and pickups. Meanwhile, at forward operating base Price in Goreshk, Number 2 Company of the Grenadier Guards are settling into their seats in the back of two RAF Chinook helicopters. As they check their kit and gear one last time, the two heavy lift helicopters steadily clamber skyward, dip their noses and accelerate north. A pair of British Army Apaches keep loose formation, escorting the big transports into the battle area. Right on time, the Royal Welsh step into the attack against their target bridge. The two Chinooks thunder onto the landing zone a kilometre to the east. They are on the ground for just seconds as the Grenadiers sprint down the rear ramps into the swirling cloud of dust and quickly form an all-round defence. Climbing skyward again, they bank south to pick up and then deliver the second half of Number 3 Company. 30 minutes later, with the whole company safely on the ground, Viking amphibious personnel carriers from the Royal Marines Armoured Support Group arrive to ferry them up to the Green Zone. Making good time, they trundle through B Company's freshly secured position. One Royal Welsh traces its lineage back to the legendary defenders of Rourke's Drift, so has honoured its heritage by naming the newly captured bridge Zulu Crossing. Number 3 Company and their Vikings slowly negotiate the Ramshackle Bridge and deploy into the Green Zone. The objective of Number 3 Company is Mirmandap. Like much of the Helmand River Valley, the village is a web of compounds and fields, bordered by dense tree lines and muddy irrigation ditches. The going on foot will be slow and laborious. Their commander, Captain King Evans, is keen to move as quickly as possible to exploit the surprise of the Royal Welsh's attack. Number 3 Company dismounts their transports and steadily advances on the village with bayonets fixed. 
Evidence of daily life is all around, with food left on stoves and livestock left tied to posts, but the villages of Mirmandap are nowhere to be found. Slowly and methodically, the Grenadier Guards begin clearing the village. Each platoon bounds from compound to compound, kicking and blasting through locked doors, clearing each building room by room. The company begins receiving sporadic bursts of automatic fire from the south. While the fire is ineffective, parts of Number 3 Company are forced to engage, slowing the British advance and giving the Taliban time to regroup. While the stragglers delay the Grenadiers, the main Taliban force of approximately 150 has been regrouping on the southwestern side of the village and lie in wait. In the late afternoon, as the British infantry take up positions in a large compound around halfway into Mirmandap, the Taliban counterattack. RPG after RPG explodes against the thick mud walls of the compound. One rocket punches straight through the compound wall and lands at the feet of two grenadiers, miraculously failing to detonate. Lying flat on the roofs of the compound buildings, the grenadiers suppress the Taliban in the nearby tree lines with their general purpose machine guns. Constant bursts of Mini-Me and SA-80 rifle fire add to the chaos of the fighting. The Taliban insurgents in Helmand have been noted for their tenacity, tactical skill and discipline, and stand and fight unflinchingly, even as British fire support pummels their position. In addition to artillery support, the Grenadiers fire support team coordinates with a nearby Apache attack helicopter to suppress the insurgents. The Apache AH-1, callsign Ugly 50, has just arrived on station. The British Army Air Corps 662 Squadron have been supporting the Royal Welsh most of the day with their Apache AH-1s, license-built and improved variants of the original Boeing AH-64D produced by Westland Helicopters in Yeovil in Somerset. They have just arrived back from being refuelled and rearmed at Camp Bastion. The Grenadier Guard's embedded forward air controller talks the crew onto a nearby compound being used as the Taliban's main fighting position. Ugly 5-0 begins neutralising insurgents in the open with steady bursts from their 30mm chain gun. Orbiting above, the Apache crew discuss their options for continuing the attack. Tim, the gunner, whose surname is redacted for security purposes, is concerned that the thick mud walls of the compound, which the Taliban are sheltering behind, will be impervious to their 30mm cannon and even the 70mm CRV-7 rockets they have slung under each stub wing. Baz, flying the aircraft from the rear seat, rolls the Apache into a gentle bank and extends out to the east, across the canal, before turning back in. Tim lasers the compound and arms a Hellfire anti-tank missile. As soon as the Hellfire leaves the rail, it ignores the laser and careens wildly off target. Tim and Baz watch in horror as it disappears, rocketing towards friendly lines. It lands dangerously close to a unit of the Royal Welsh, advancing out of the bridgehead, but fortunately causes no damage. Fearing that all their hellfires might be defective, the Apache crew double-check with the Grenadier Guard's forward air controller before firing another. Widow 68, this is ugly. Are you sure you want us to do this? The fact replies, too damn right, we're taking heavy fire, Hit that compound with everything you've got, shouting to make himself heard over the firefight raging in the background. As the Apache thunders around for a second attempt, the forward air controller attached to the Royal Welsh adds wryly, Ugly, if you're putting in another hellfire, give us time to get our bloody heads down. The second hellfire leaps from the rail, flies straight and true, and plunges down into the Taliban compound. With the protective mud walls blown away, Tim, in the gunner's seat, pulls a fusillade of shells from the 30mm chain gun into the exposed position, eliminating the surviving insurgents. Ugly 5-0 breaks off to assist other troops in contact, but lingering Taliban continue to harass the grenadiers, only withdrawing as night falls. Meanwhile, the 2nd Kandak from 3rd Brigade of the Afghan 205th Corps, supported by mentors from No. 2 Company of the Grenadier Guards, arrive at Zulu Crossing, relieving one Royal Welsh. The Taliban harass the crossing with periodic mortar fire, though with little result. Several fighters infiltrate through the tree lines and their parallel ditches, almost reaching the bridge before being engaged by Afghan troops defending the far bank. 
Two of the insurgents advance further and are cut down by 50 caliber machine guns of the Mentor's WMIKs, ending the ill-prepared counterattack. B Company of the Royal Welsh arrives in Mirmandat shortly after dark, passing through the Grenadiers to continue the advance. The Welsh and Grenadiers spend much of the next day clearing the compounds of Mirmandat and the surrounding area, slowed by sporadic Taliban resistance. As the sun rises on the 26th of July, No. 3 Company Grenadier Guards is tasked to advance west and clear that flank of the newly captured village. As soon as the company steps off into the attack, they're hit with a withering hail of fire from a large Taliban force gathered in the tree lines and compounds to the west. As rounds crack and fizz past them, the Grenadier Guards meet the ambush, sprinting into the score of irrigation ditches and spiritedly engaging the enemy some of whom are just 100 metres away. Kalashnikovs and SA-80s mark a frantic staccato of traded fire. The Grenadiers' vital machine gunners suppress the entrenched insurgents for hours on end, but due to the massive volume of fire they're sending downrange, the guardsmen soon find themselves having to field strip and maintain their weapons to keep them running. As the vicious firefight develops, the Grenadiers' fire support group gets to work. From the ditches and under the shade of the pine trees, they load FGM-148 javelins onto their launcher units and pick out the more distant targets. The missiles burst from their launchers and climb skyward, precisely plummeting on to more distant Taliban fighters. The platoon keeps up the barrage, firing off more and more javelins. Guardsman David Atherton, a popular member of the anti-tank platoon, nicknamed Jaffa by his mates, loads another javelin onto its launcher unit, locks on to the Taliban position and launches the weapon. He and his comrades watch with satisfaction as a puff of flame and brown dust marks the missile's impact. But, as they move to continue firing, Atherton is struck and mortally wounded by enemy fire. Guardsman David Atherton, 25, is the second British soldier killed in three days of fighting in Helmand province. With the battle dragging on for hours at this point, Captain King Evans decides that his force must regain the initiative. The fire support team directs newly arrived Apache gunships onto the Taliban fighting positions, which they systematically strike with Hellfire missiles. Using this break, King Evans moves forward to meet the commander of his most forward platoon. Meeting in a field just to the rear of the platoon, the captain greets Lieutenant Tort Peterson and tasks him with assaulting the nearest compound. Taliban fire suddenly rains down around them. King Evans and Lieutenant Tort Peterson reply with their own fusillade of return fire before sprinting back to their respective units. The lead section of the platoon, led by Lance Sergeant Bayliss, fights their way forward and breaches the compound. The surviving Taliban abandon the position due to the weight of fire directed at it, and some of the buildings are now burning. Bayliss's section occupies the fighting position, extinguishing the fire in the process. They are followed rapidly by the rest of the platoon and the company headquarters, from the new vantage point, the British forces are able to dominate the surrounding area, and at around 1800 hours that evening, after 12 gruelling hours of combat in the Afghan heat, the defeated Taliban slip away into the green zone. With the Royal Welsh and the Grenadier Guards embroiled in the fight for Mirmandap in the southwest, the battle group headquarters is increasingly concerned about their open northern flank through which groups of insurgents up to 150 strong are flooding in. Due to the much stiffer resistance, Battle Group South has almost no additional forces to push towards Hyderabad. The task of plugging the gap falls to the Afghans and the Brigade Reconnaissance Force. The Brigade Reconnaissance Force presses north, battling with the Taliban defending the village of Koganyi, suffering five men injured. 2nd Kandak is ordered to send some of its forces over the canal to help plug the gap in the northern flank near Hyderabad. The Afghan commander elects to stay at the bridgehead, so the Mentor's officer, 2nd Lieutenant Cordell, leads two Afghan platoons and the Mentor team north through the fields and compounds. After a day of minor skirmishes with the Taliban, they secure a collection of compounds near the canal and rest for the night. They are reinforced by 60 men from 1st Kandak and 10 more British mentors from the Grenadiers, rapidly brought over from Gereshk. On the afternoon of the 27th, 20 men of the Afghan National Army's 2nd Kandak Brigade, led by Cordell, move out from the village, 
out from the supporting overwatch of the rest of the Afghan and British troops in their compound, through the dense tree lines and into the wheat fields ahead. Their mission is to link up with the Royal Welsh, who are now over a kilometre away on the other side of the canal. Moving in a typical patrol formation, a long extended file, the Afghans and their British advisers keep careful watch on the surrounding hedgerows and compounds. All appears quiet among the distant rumble of battle. A salvo of RPGs bursts from a tree line to their north, exploding around them and whizzing overhead. Taliban machine gun fire rips through the Afghan ranks from a compound just 30 metres in front, killing the soldier in front of Cordal and injuring three more. The British officer darts for cover in a nearby irrigation ditch and returns fire with his SA-80. In the chaos, the surviving Afghan soldiers retreat behind the compounds to their rear, to shelter with their grievously wounded comrades. They do not alert any of their British mentors to this fact and make no attempt to rejoin the fight. As far as Cordell knows, the Afghans have just run off, leaving him stranded and exposed facing a massive Taliban ambush. Cordell is quickly joined by one of the other British mentors, Lance Corporal Arca Tinnis. The fire support team of Sergeant Brooks and Bombardier Greenland of the Royal Artillery scramble across the field and into the ditch beside them. Not satisfied with routing the Afghan patrol, the Taliban press their attack down the nearby tree line towards the Grenadiers. Cordell and Arcatinis desperately defend their position, stopping the advancing fighters with sustained accurate rifle fire, burning through magazine after magazine. Despite the torrent of incoming rounds cracking overhead and kicking up dirt around them, Greenland, a seasoned forward air controller, rapidly gets to work while Sergeant Brooks calls in the first of many danger-close fire missions from supporting 105mm artillery. As the first shells land, Greenland directs a pair of Apache attack helicopters onto the muzzle flashes surrounding them. Ugly 5-0 and Ugly 5-1 are once again cruising towards Mirmandat. The Apache crews of No. 662 Squadron Army Air Corps have been in the thick of the action around the clock, and the 27th of July is shaping up to be no different. The first mission of Ugly Flight is to take over from their squadron mates supporting a forward air controller with the callsign Widow 75. The 662 Squadron Apaches on station conduct a handover, briefly informing Baz and Tim in Ugly 5-0 of the location of friendly and enemy forces and the basic situation before they return back to Camp Bastion. Ugly Flight have worked with Widow 75 several times prior, and the Apache crews admire his exceptionally calm and understated demeanour. From the other flight's description, his situation seems intense, like almost all of the fighting so far, but not perilous. Just as 5-0 and 5-1 arrive on station and begin searching for targets, the headquarters at Camp Bastion alerts the Apache crews. Ugly, this is Zero Bravo. We've lost all contact with a widow. They're cut off, down to a handful of men, and we haven't heard from them in some time. We think they've been captured, or are in imminent danger of capture. Roger, Zero Bravo, what's his call sign? Baz asks. We're not sure, Ugly. Try them all. Find them. Out. Breaking off to rush to the crisis, the Ugly flight crew hurriedly check in with each Widow forward air controller in the area, even 7-5. None appear to be in anything like the danger described by Camp Bastion. After a moment, it occurs to the Apache crews that 7-5's unflappable nature might not be conveying the true peril of their situation. Widow 7-5, this is Ugly. Tell us again, just how bad is your situation? Well, you could say we're in a spot of bother, Ugly, Bombardier Greenland admits. There's four guys down here, including me. The Afghan National Army have all run away. The enemy have surrounded us on all sides. They're 50 metres close in all buildings and the tree line. We're running short of ammo and up to our bollocks in water. Other than that, the sun's shining and it's a great day. With that, the Apaches get to work. Greenland, Brooks, Lieutenant Cordell and Lance Corporal Arcatinis are pinned down. There's too many Taliban to push forward, and the hail of Kalashnikov and heavy machine gun fire tearing overhead means any attempt to retreat would be catastrophic. All they can do is stand and fight. The Taliban are adept at pinning down and manoeuvring around coalition troops. Part of the ambush group keeps pummeling the irrigation ditch with light machine guns and RPGs, while Taliban manoeuvre elements move down the flank to try and overrun the British troops. Greenland and Brooks are able to survey the enemy movements thanks to a feed from an orbiting UAV. Taunting them in Pashto and trying to intimidate them by making animal noises, 
A group of insurgents sprint closer, just metres away. Greenland talks Ugly 5-0 in. The bastards are coming for us, Ugly. I need fire on that tree line now. Circling above, Tim slews the M230 chain gun onto the tree line and lets fly with a long 20 round burst. The danger area for the 30mm is 150 meters, but Cordell and his comrades are far closer than that. Greenland asks 5 0 to bring their fire even nearer. The Apache's cannon chatters again, and 20 more high explosive rounds rip through the trees and explode amongst the undergrowth, cutting down the leading Taliban. Greenland shouts jubilantly over the radio, urging the Apaches to press the attack. 5-0 and 5-1 mercilessly walk their devastating cannon fire up and down the tree line. Flurries of shells ravage the exposed insurgents. But many of the fighters are dug in, deeper in the tree lines, in trenches and in nearby compounds which are resistant to the 30mm fire. Despite the onslaught, the Taliban keep coming, an ugly flight is beginning to run low on ammo and options. After a brief discussion, the aircrew suggests that the best option is to use their CRV-7 rockets from a steep dive to improve their accuracy. Greenland agrees, despite the extreme danger of friendly fire. Ugly Flight banks onto the target, a tree line next to one of the main Taliban compounds, less than 100 metres away from the British troops. Pushing the nose down into a near vertical dive, Baz adjusts the controls to bring the I-shaped reticle onto the target as the aircraft accelerates rapidly towards the earth shaking as the airspeed builds. Ugly 5-0 lets fly, and four high-sap rockets explode amongst the attacking insurgents. Pulling out at low altitude, the lead Apache rapidly climbs back above the trees and the compound walls to orbit the target. 5-0 follows the manoeuvre, slamming another salvo of rockets into the position. As 5-1 pulls out, 5-0 is ready to re-attack. Diving in again, out of high-sap, they ripple off 70mm fleshette rockets. These weapons have a buckshot effect, and a salvo can carpet an area the size of a football pitch with 640 tungsten darts. With their steep dive, the ugly airmen hope to reduce the area of effect. The fleshettes scythe through the trees and undergrowth, striking down yet more Taliban. Some of the fleshettes even land in Greenland and Cordell's ditch. Yet, Widow 75 is ecstatic with the amount of fire the Apaches are pouring on, but it's still not enough. Going around again in their racetrack pattern, the two Apaches finish off their rockets and salvo off hellfire after hellfire into every compound and visible Taliban position, firing 11 in total. After finishing off the last of their 30mm ammo on the tree line, the Apaches resort to swooping low over the woods through the enemy's small arms fire and deploying flares to try and set fire to the Taliban positions while they wait for more help to arrive. Just as Ugly Flight is relieved by two more Apaches, a Royal Air Force Harrier GR9 arrives on station. Cordell and his men, down to their last magazines, decide they have to move now. Greenland talks the Harrier onto the group of compounds currently pinning them down, just 100 metres to the east. The Harrier confirms the compound's position and releases either a 540 pound or a 1000 pound bomb. Fused to air bursts, the bomb obliterates the Taliban stronghold and, after recovering from the overpowering blast and bewildering noise of the explosion, the British troops move. Bounding by fire and movement, using their last rounds to suppress the enemy, Cordell and his men make a break for friendly lines as RPGs and machine gun fire chase them. The new Apache flight covers them as best they can, battering the insurgents with yet more rockets and 30mm cannon fire. Miraculously, the men make it, finding a relief column of Mastiff and Viking personnel carriers and their Afghan troops waiting for them. With the hammering they've received and the arrival of more British forces, the Taliban decide to withdraw. At least 30 to 50 insurgents have been killed, trying to overrun the British troops. Cordell's fight for survival is the last major close engagement with the Taliban during this stage of Operation Chakush. The Grenadier Guards, Royal Welsh and Afghan forces cleared the bulk of the Taliban forces out of the area in a few more days of skirmishing, and the Royal Engineers successfully established the new forward operating base. Three British and at least one Afghan servicemen have been killed over the course of Operation Chakush. There are few reliable estimates on Taliban losses, but they are estimated to be heavy, given there were far more Taliban fighters present than initially anticipated, and taking into account the ferocity of the fighting. 
Thanks again to our sponsor Conflict of Nations for supporting this video. Don't forget to support the Operations Room by clicking the link in the description below and starting your journey to global victory today. Thanks again to our amazing patrons whose support enables us to make these videos. Thank you to all our new patrons who joined recently, and a special thanks to our Patron of the Week, Kevin Taylor. Each week we choose our favourite Patreon comments to shout out. This week, JTAD says, One would think that such overwhelming firepower and losses would have turned back the Taliban sooner, but they were obviously overly committed. If you'd like to support us, please join our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash the operations room, and get access to exclusive benefits such as early access to videos ad and sponsor free. We'd love to have you as part of our community and really appreciate your support.